Welcome, everyone. I'm here to talk to you a little bit more about community ownership and, of course, to amplify wonderful leaders and organizations on the ground that are doing just that here in San Diego. So if I'm not sure if any of you participated in our morning session related to Just Transition. We have some of our Just Transition people here. Thank you for being here. Um, just Transition, raise of hands. Do we know about it? Raise your hand. Wonderful. Okay, I'm not going to explain just transition. That is not this session, but I'll give you a, a, just a short description of what that might be. So just transition is a framework in sort of our nonprofit sector and the philanthropic sector. We're trying to move away from harmful practices into more regenerative ones. Today's discussion is founded on regenerative practices that are creating more healing in our community. And so just know that it, it comes from this place. And if you want to learn more, our Just Transition people are here. The San Diego Food System Alliance is here and using this framework as well so you can learn more. So as I mentioned, I'm Chantal Suarez Avila, she, her, hers, and I'm founder of Masaya Consulting. It's a fundraising um, consulting firm that practices community-centric and values-aligned uh, fundraising. We work with nonprofit, le nonprofit uh, leaders from across the U.S., specifically working with BIPOC communities because we know we need more money in, in our communities, and we also need more uh, agency to say what we need so that folks can support the work on the ground. I'm also a resident, resident of Escondido, and I'm <laughs> learning how to garden with my partner here, Dominic. So this was our first strawberry last year, so I was very happy about that. <laughs> um, and I'm here as your, as your facilitator today. Um, beyond that, why am I here? Why am I in this space? Why am I connected to these wonderful people? It's because I believe that we can all be self-determined and we can figure out how to do that for each other. I'm also here because I believe in creating economies that serve especially BIPOC communities and we can figure out how to do that. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and now move us into our panel discussion. And I'll have our lovely, lovely, lovely pan oh, well, actually, never mind, I'm just playing. Um, just a little bit, so today we're gonna have a panel discussion, we're gonna follow it up with some Q&A, so if you have some questions, there's some paper on your tables, you write it down and we can talk about it during Q&A. We'll do some round table discussion so that we can pull the wisdom from our room and also do some networking at the end so you all have some, an opportunity to connect with each other. Okay, so let's start off with um, doing a self-reflection. If you want, just you can um, either do this just in your mind or if you want to write it down, feel free. So today's uh, self-reflection is about power. And when we think about community ownership, it really is about power. So I want to ground ourselves in our sense of power, whether it's power over, power with, or power from within. Think about what brings you to this session. What sort of power do you currently practice? And who influenced your sense of power? So we'll just take a few minutes, just in silence. Feel free to write it down. And, uh, and then we'll get started so we can get ourselves in a, in a good place. I know it's going to be an amazing panel discussion because these are wonderful leaders um, here with us today. I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves um, before we move into uh, discussion. Good afternoon, everybody. Alexis Villanueva, the executive director of City Heights Community Development Corporation. Hi everyone, my name is Dominique Navarro and I'm the Operations Director for the Environmental Health Coalition. Hello everybody, my name is Kimi Mojica, I'm the Senior Consulting Director for Justice Funders. Hi everyone, I'm Sona Desai and I'm a Co-Executive Director of the San Diego Food System Alliance. And y'all, do you mind just sharing a little bit of your intention with our friends here? Um, why are you here? You obviously were invited for a special reason. Um, if you can just share your intention so that folks can, can feel that. Uh, well, I think 
as a first off, thank you to the Food System Alliance. Uh, you know, the amazing group and organizations doing amazing work, and they've been for a long time. So, um, it's a privilege to be up here speaking uh, and being asked to speak. Uh, I think. For me, my value system as a leader, as an executive director, is about sharing knowledge and making sure that that's probably the most powerful tool that we can do with community. Um, and then us as leaders using the platform to make sure to share that line of knowledge and then create power within sharing that knowledge and moving it forward. So for me being here, taking these moments to give insight to what we're doing, to what's in my mind as we're into undertaking this work, and hoping to help other leaders, regardless of where you are in your organization or in the community, to be motivated by that and continue that work together. Yeah, I definitely agree. I'm in a similar vein about sharing experiences. I think it's really important, particularly coming from an organization that's been around for 42 years, to share things that we've learned, things that we've learned the hard way, but also to establish relationships. I see a lot of amazing people that we've worked with that we're establishing partnerships with, and that's the way that we've been able to grow our strength in the community. We're only gonna be able to, we're only as powerful as the networks we're building and as the base we're building in our neighborhoods, and the more disparate that our work is, the more ineffective that we're gonna be. So definitely excited to you know continue um, having conversations about potential partnerships, and then, um, I think for anyone who knows me, I'm also like a very honest person, and so really excited um, to have the chance if there's any funders, like I'm gonna tell it how it is, so. <laughs> yeah, um, well, my name's Kimmy again, and I ditto to both of these pieces. I think what centers um, my visit here and being the invitation is really relationships, and also being a chance to walk with um, community groups and movement and as, as, as a person that works in the philanthropic sector. sector. And, and that, that um, what, what does it mean to be in true authentic relationship, relationship to support the shift of capital, capital and power to communities in iterative incremental times, times but having deeper and deeper relationships outside of just the dollars. And so, and so part of that is to feel that energy here, to build relationships with folks here, but also to share stories of how folks are also doing that in different ways. And uh, just, yeah, yeah, I'm really honored and uh, feel deeply humbled to be here. So thank you. Thank you. So being in this position, I can say what they said. Um, so I'm here um, because of everything they said. And also, um, I'm here to share. I'm here to listen. I'm here to learn. Um, I'm here to be a part of this movement that is working to seed community ownership and cooperative development in San Diego County. Um, yeah. Thank you. Maybe I can start with um, whoever would like to go first, but um, we know that doing this type of work is challenging, right? Doing something different that is not in mainstream can sometimes be challenging. Um, Maybe, can you talk to us about why you chose this path? Doing something outside of the mainstream, advocating, experimenting with community ownership. Oh, um, I, 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 think, I think I've always wanted to be, or always thought about being a servant leader and what that, and what that, in, what that looks like inside of a person. Um, and I started actually my career in social work and there was a lot of band-aid work happening, so to speak, like we weren't really getting to the root of problems. And so when I saw that, I kind of felt like I was wasting my time and energy on just you know, putting together interventions that weren't helping our families, but instead were just amplifying the continued oppression and um, harm in our families. And so from that, I started to learn more about what could I do. Um, and again, there's, there's you know, it, it is heavy work, it is challenging work, but um, as a servant leader, when you start to learn more, and again, I'll go back to the education component, as you learn more, as you navigate your career, as you start asking questions more, you start learning you know, where that kind of seed grows in yourself, um, where, where do I feel most appropriate and comfortable to address um, some of the things that we know to be wrong in our community, so, you know, maybe 10 years ago, I probably wouldn't have said, um, that you know this space weren't meant for us and places of power don't look like people sitting around the table like me um, 
but I'm damn going to sit. I'm damned if I'm not going to sit in a chair in that circle um, or call security. Um, and so, like, you know, so I think 10 years ago, I probably wouldn't do that. But now learning so much and having built in the confidence and spoken to community and understood some of the crisis that honestly we cannot not speak about at this point. Um, and, and uplift, and as I said earlier, being in this position as an executive director, I shouldn't be here if I'm not gonna use that platform to continue to uplift the things in which we see in our communities that are not right, um, and continue to uplift that education component, bringing our community listening, because I think that's, that's really, really important. Um, um, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, happy to, happy to go. go. Um, um, so, so, so I was, I was, I was born, born in the United, United States, States um, and, and at the eight, when, when I was three, three months, months old, I actually went, went um, back, back to India with, with my grandparents because, because I was the first generation to be born, born here, here, and my grandparents couldn't imagine um, not, not being able to be a part of my life. So, so I had this had unique experience of going back to India, India being, being raised by my grandparents, grandparents and I say grandparents, grandparents um, but, but I was actually raised by a village. Um, um, a village of, a village, of, a village which was my extended family until I was four years old. I didn't come back to the US until I was four years old. And so, and so what, what I experienced, I experienced um, from three, three months, months to four, four, I mean, so we had an agrarian family, we had a farm, we had a farm, it was like the village's farm, it wasn't our farm, it was the village's farm. It was um, my first um, experience of, of the collective, not necessarily the individual. And I came to the US at four and I basically had an experience of slowly assimilating to the culture of I and the culture of the individual. And it wasn't until I resisted and wanted to farm, start farming, where I experienced a lot of resistance, not only from my family, my parents, because they wanted me to assimilate more, but I also experienced resistance from from farmers in America because I didn't quite look like them. And I experienced a lot of challenges with trying to establish my own small family, my, my small farm. And in doing so, I think that was the seed that really planted inside of me of I want to create opportunities for people that have had experiences similar to mine to be able to farm produce, grow food, food, cook food, food in ways that, that are aligned with their culture and their roots and their identity. And for a lot of cultures, it's about the collective. So mobilizing resources for community ownership is, for me, it's about the collective and it's about the village and how do we all work together, not for our individual success, but for our collective success. Thank um, I'm gonna riff off of that a bit. I think when I was thinking about what's, what's that co-ownership, why am I here? I was thinking about my ancestors and also thinking about the generations that are coming after and that piece about what does it mean to be in the collective. And as a person that comes from um, communities or identities, um, being queer, person of color, um, an immigrant as well, my family coming in from the Philippines, I think there's many um, challenges that uh, the US and uh, systems that we have to navigate. And even just internalized stuff, you know, like the assimilation or homophobia that existed, I think it was actually community and extended community, both not those by blood and my family of origin, but actually extended family by choice that supported and cared for me. Um, and offered me home and food and, and, and a warm hug or a blanket when I needed. And so I think, I would also just say that I, I also feel like plants and the, and the earth and the land carry its own medicine. And in those times of also um, struggle and healing, I go to the land. And I feel like um, when I get to mobilize resources or support folks who are trying to see this work of philanthropy as aligning with um, folks' community, folks' vision of just transition, like what's our role to resource, to give those, get those resources out of the extractive system and move it. I think, I think part, part of that, that is, in some ways, gifting, gifting back, back to folks, folks that, that cared for me when I may not have had those resources myself, myself. Um, and, and thinking about, about the medicine that the earth has given me to support me in finding my own medicine. 
Um, it also these plants and these things that are much older than us, when we're working and breaking down walls and systems and trying to like find your people while in them, I feel like um, the medicine of the earth actually reminds us of our own. And I can be able to transverse systems and, and different and talk to different people and do storytelling. I think storytelling is part of my medicine and part of what around the food, around the table is that storytelling. Um, and it just creates a, like these relationships that don't happen over Zoom calls and emails and things like that. So moving things from transactional to relational um, and being just like rooted in that um, co-stewardship of this earth and of these resources. Um, for me, it's really personal. I mean, I was blessed, you know, as a child of Mexican immigrants to be able to go to college, and I remember sitting in an environmental justice class, and they were talking about environmental justice communities, talking about, uh, you know, communities that have high rates of asthma, communities that don't have trees, that don't have parks, that have manufacturing next to homes, and I remember sitting there like, oh, shit, that's my neighborhood. <laughs> like, that's where I grew up. Like, I can't think of a single park I could have walked to going down the street. Like, like my, my like, like cousins, cousins have, have asthma, asthma. like, like the, the, uh, dementia, dementia like, like uh, my, my grandma, grandma has dementia like, like it's been there's, there's a strong correlation between air pollution and dementia there was like manufacturing down the street and it was very like, like dangerous, dangerous to walk there's, there's no trees, trees and gets really hot, hot. and so, so for me it was very personal and that kind of steered me into the environmental space and then starting at a like more traditional environmental organization I remember some of the language being you know, know kind of difficult for me to process, process of like, like um, I, think I think of my, my own ingrained understanding. understanding. So, so when, you know, you know we would talk about leadership and being like, like well, I'm not a leader. Like, like I, you know, I, I don't have, I'm not in a, in a tie, suit and tie. I'm not going to city council. I'm not making decisions. And so I think for me, part of that journey has been like redefining some of the definitions that we have ingrained in ourselves, like our own imposter syndrome of what it means to be a leader and to affect change. But then also like some of the things that we also perpetuate and we don't mean to, but things when we talk about like, like communities, communities without, without power, power. That, that you know, you know like, like these communities, communities do have power. power. It, it may, may not be the traditional decision making power that, that everyone, everyone thinks of, of but that's, that's not, not to negate the collective building that they have all done to sustain each other. other. And, and same, same with my work, work that, that I have, have with the Latina Giving Circle. Shout out to the LGC members in the room. Redefining what philanthropy means and what a philanthropist means. Like. My, my grandmother, grandmother went, went and volunteered, volunteered at like the like local like, like preschool. preschool. She, she went, went and volunteered with her church. She, she gave of her, her time. time. She, she constantly, constantly sent boxes home back to Mexico. Like, like these, these people are also donors, donors and philanthropists. And, philanthropists. and so, so I, think I think for me, like, like the, the reason I'm so committed, committed to this work is because I really want like again to uplift all of this incredible, incredible work that's happening in the communities and this collective ownership that's already happening um, and to bring it to the forefront. Thank you, I'm hearing there's a lot of love for community. There's um, just wanting to expand community beyond the I, right? And uh, recognizing that we have power and ensuring that folks feel that as well. Um, so going back to a little bit about uh, Just Transition, some of the characteristics of Just Transition framework going into a regenerative economy, a more healing sort of uh, way of being and living on this earth is uh, having more democracy in our structures, having more cooperation among people, um, and having more care, right? Whether it be to each other, to our lands, to our animals, to our planet, right? Um, and I know I'm probably missing one, but I feel like those are the ones that come to mind, uh, Kimmy, so you can totally let us know, <laughs> update us. Um, but those are some characteristics, and I, I share that with you for those of you who, who, who don't know that. Um, we have folks here that are doing uh, work that sort of reflects these type of characteristics, and sometimes there's a myth that these things aren't happening, and it's it's not true, right? It's not true. People are being bold. People are being creative. It's just, do we want to listen? Do we want to spotlight them? Well, today we're spotlighting four incredible stories and organizations, so I'm going to let um, these wonderful folks here share a little bit more about how they're, they're, they're mobilizing resources for community ownership. 
first. Oh, um, so I think uh, to kind of what the, the all the ladies have kind of spoken about, um, and, and I have too, like the system of which we're evolving in right now wasn't collectively made for community. It wasn't made by community members sitting at the table. The processes you look at um, are somewhat backwards when we think about just how we do things in community. Um, so I think for our organization, um, we've learned to almost look at an outside inside model, right? Our inside model is our community. We're talking to our community constantly. We're convening our community constantly. Um, our CDC has been in City Heights for 40 years and we started as an advocacy organization, right? So we, we fought against the SR15 coming and cutting between, um, well, cutting City Heights in half. And then ever since then, it's been about advocacy. Um, what we found to be successful was that in order to make real change and sustainable change though, it does have to utilize that outside game of policy, processes, protocol, and in particular in philanthropy and fundraising, the RFP process, uh, you know, government funding, the way that they do things. And so um, to, to your point, community has already figured out how to solve problems. There are some of the best problem solvers that we have in our organization and who we talk to. So for us, it's more about how do we utilize what we're learning from our community, um, you know, down from farming all the way up to organizing, I mean, the way that families organize their finances when they're trying to live off of the most most small budget, it's like it's phenomenal. And those are just some of the skills that our family has learned through resiliency and having very little. So all of these skills that we take and when we're talking to families, we're utilizing that framework to go out in the outside game and talk to you know the politicians and the community leaders and those who are creating those processes at the table. One, to make spaces for community, because it doesn't need to be us, and I think that's the other part of this work, is it doesn't need to be me sitting at the table, it doesn't need to be my colleagues, it should be them. But in the meantime, let's make sure that they're hearing those voices. Um, and then secondly, giving um, examples and also rewriting some of those policies so that policymakers and other processes with the state and other elected or just community leaders can see what that looks like. Um, we are about impact in our organization, right? So if one model isn't working, we're gonna shift and look at another bottle that's working. At the end of the day, our hope is that system change happens and that's in the policy work and the outside work and it's connected to what's happening with the inside work for our community and that we're testing that efficacy um, around the work to make sure that we're also aligned. Uh, because we also understand things like COVID can change the landscape totally. And then we have to pivot and make sure that we're hearing the things of which our community needs or is prioritizing. So that's a little bit, I think, how we're, how we're trying to look at that model and use that model. Um, I, know it's, I know it's difficult also because sometimes you walk into rooms with electeds and they have no idea. And again, I'm being brave right now. Um, because that seeds bigger to call out electeds, but that's the reality. Like you're sitting in rooms and these are the same people who have no idea what it is to live off of a small budget, have no idea of what it is to be homeless or unsheltered, have no idea what it is to be fearful that you're not gonna have a home tomorrow. So again, like I think also our organization has built around that level of compassion for electeds. Um, and I'll go back to that same place of like education. How do we educate our electeds, our, our structures, our government structures, our representatives, our community leaders to understand the full capacity of what's going on in our community and to elevate those voices soon to make spaces for those voices so that it's not us just talking. Um, it should be our community talking. Um, I won't mention how the Environmental Health Coalition does our work because it's very similar. So our, our organizing and our advocacy model is very similar to City Heights CDC and we partner all the time. Um, but I do want to uplift one project that we're working on now. And so the state of California has a transformative climate communities grant program. And this grant program, it's one of the most competitive and difficult applications in the state, but it's an opportunity to bring in millions of dollars. If, if we are successful in this application, we will bring in $29.5 million to the community of Barrio Logan. So it's amazing. And, 
and we fundraise an additional 17 million. So we're going to add about like 56 million um, dollars that we'll be bringing into Logan. And I, I, the, I uplift this project because I think it's really innovative in a couple ways. First, it's entirely community led. The city of San Diego refused to be the lead applicant. And if you work for the city and you're in the room, I'm sorry, but it's true. Um, and so they refused to step up as the lead applicant. And so we were, as a, as a community organization, we were stuck. Like we can't manage $56 million. So I think one key part is obviously partnership with philanthropy. I think philanthropy plays a, plays a key role in not a, nonprofits and philanthropy play a key role in filling in the gaps in our like government and in the services that are being provided. And so as a more established organization, we were very lucky that we had fantastic relationships with philanthropy and the San Diego Foundation stepped in to be the lead applicant. And then, and then we were, we're able, able to get, to get um, additional, additional funding, funding to put together, together the application. The application, the application took over eight months um, to put together. We spent, I think, almost a million dollars in putting together the application, in staff time, in consultants, in stipends to community members. Because we were not going to ask them to come to the table without giving them stipends. And yes, very exciting. And, and we, we put, put together, together a community, community advisory board, board. And, and so, so this advisory board, board are community, community representatives who gave, gave us feedback, feedback who, who said, I like that project, no, I don't like that project, let's prioritize this. So like tree plantings were the number one thing that they wanted in Logan, followed by affordable housing. And so we started prioritizing our projects, allocating our budget according to the needs, and then we, we had this community advisory board tell us, you know what, that partner's not a good partner. They have been doing really shady things in the community and we don't feel comfortable. And they are off the application. We had to honor what the community was telling us. And this community advisory board is gonna keep going forward. And so we're gonna continue to stipend them throughout the project. They're gonna continue to meet throughout the project to keep us accountable, to make sure that we're using the money as we said we were gonna use it, to make sure we're working on time, to help if there's things, if a partner is not um, operating, operating in a way that it's in alignment, alignment with the community's vision, vision and values to question their placement in the application. And, and we, we have all that built into a stakeholder structure. structure. So we have, we have an established, established stakeholder structure. structure. We, we have, have over 12, 12 partners on this stakeholder structure. structure. So, so it's, it's, it's the, the biggest, biggest collaboration, collaboration that I know of in the Barrio Logan neighborhood for the biggest amount of money. And so it includes everything from an electric shuttle to a park to tree plantings to solar on homes, solar on the museum. Um, and, um, and we, we are actually, actually established a community land trust. trust. So, so talking, talking about, about building community ownership, this is the first community land trust in Barrio Logan. Logan. As, as many of you know, know Barrio Logan, Logan is one of the most rapidly gentrifying rapidly neighborhoods. neighborhoods. Residents are being displaced and we need to get property off the market. And so we are looking at purchasing our first two properties with this grant. It's very exciting. And this is an entirely resident-led board. None of them have, have ever, ever worked, worked in this, in this space, space. So, so we had, had a lot of support from partners like Cal Endowment to get them to community, community land trust trainings, trainings and conferences and building relationships. relationships. And so, so we're, we're, we're so excited and I think it's an important role that EHC has played. played. We, we are, are not, not their fiscal, fiscal sponsor, sponsor, also let me say that. We seeded them and we said, you go. We are not an expert in community land trust. We don't need to hold you. Please go to the partner that makes sense. And so I think also this you know, you know, more established, established organizations, organizations also have a role to play in seeding that community ownership and letting go of it and letting the community drive it forward. Yes. Uh, it's all good. Um, I'm going to give a little context about justice funders. In many ways, in order for philanthropy to walk and be in partnership with community, they need their own political home. And so justice funders works in that field to um, help, help folks, help folks find, find each other, other to do political to education, education, to really to actually apply that just transition framework, framework to philanthropy and, and give folks the political context, context and analysis to understand that, that we, we work, work in philanthropy, philanthropy the extractive economy. economy. What, what does it mean? Our purpose, purpose if we do believe in what movement is calling us to do, is actually to take those resources that were extracted from these communities and restore, restore restoration, restoration, give those resources, resources back or move, move them back, back into the communities in which they were taken from. from. And, and so, so in many ways, we see ourselves as, as folks that are supporting folks in philanthropy to find their people, people to also understand the landscape in which they're working in, so they also understand how to stay in the system so they can be an agent of change inside of it as well. 
And so that's so just that's a, a context, context of justice funders. funders. And, and we, uh, the first, first session today, we were talking about the just transition philanthropy. What's our role, role there? there? I'd say I the project that, that I do just, just want to lift up is we understood we are also movement accountable um, as well. And so the folks, Movement Generation, Climate Justice Alliance, they were letting us know, you know, from 2020 on at the height of the pandemic, philanthropy um, invested over 13 times more money then they're grant making into the ex expe ex speculative market investments, right? It's like they were actually making more money during the pandemic than they were investing in communities. And they didn't even have to do grant, they were doing rapid response. You may have experienced all of those things. So I think at the end of the day, we were like, well, what needs to happen? One of it is, how do we actually turn all the things that were happening in rapid response to just be normal you know, procedure? Like, you, they, they don't, don't need, need to report, report back. back. What, what if you, you just give them the money? money General operating, have them ha have, have community control over how it's used. used. You know, just, just get the money out the door. That actually, actually which needs to happen all the time. time. I think and the, the other, other piece that um, we worked actually with, with the same the folks there, there was, was to create the Just Transition Just Investment Fund. Fund. Because uh, in philanthropy, most, most folks are only spending 5% of that endowment. And that, and that was supposed to be an invitation to spend at least that amount. amount. But, but as, as we, we know in the field, field people, people use that, that as the ceiling. ceiling. So, so what, what would happen if you actually tapped into that other 95%? And if you can't release or liberate the whole you know, endowment, could we actually um, experiment with part of that. And, and so, so folks, folks created a financial tool. tool. They're actually They're like, well, it's not only about, about release, releasing the dollars, dollars but how, how do we infiltrate the financial system? system. Let's, Let's figure out the out tools, how to do that. that. And, and so, so the, the Just Transition, Transition Investment tool is something that created and that we released to support movement folks and also creating their only community development funds. So Justice Funders is doing political education with CEOs and foundation boards to do their, their only own learning own cohort, cohort on like how do we actually operationalize this framework in my home, in my place, whether I'm a, a family foundation, a corporate foundation, I'm a private family foundation, how would I do this? And if I can't release it all at once, how can I even do a small carve out? Can I do 5% that's just gonna be, let's figure out if we can imagine what we can test here and innovate. So while we're doing learning conversations here, we also had those folks who are paying tuition to support their political learning to actually seed a Just Transition Investment Fund and I'm, I'm not, not the head of that, that fund, fund, so I'm reading notes, notes but, but some of y'all know Laura in Kentucky. She, she is doing this beautiful work, work um, really bringing um, the Just Transition Investment Fund forward. And this is really the expression and experiment. Justice Funders is not a foundation, but we are a political home for folks in that field. So we're like, if we can experiment, we know you can do it, <laughs> you know, because we don't got an endowment, but you know, we're just asking folks to play in the sandbox and get creative and take some risks, but do it in collective, we collective action. You know, I think that that's this cooperative sense. It's like, we, 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 we I know a little, you know, you know, but actually, actually we know, know a lot, lot together. together. Collectively, Collectively, we know a lot. So, so even in, in the, the learnings, learning, if we can support folks in philanthropy in the learning, and, and then allow them to learn, and, and then also fund, fund these other, other spaces. spaces. So I just, just want to say this is a completely, um, the, fund the fund itself, the Just Transition Investment Fund, is 100% movement design, controlled, and governed. It is, I would say, it includes here, it's a model for philanthropy for offering foundations a learning vehicle to move endowed assets to BIPOC and working class controlled funds and grassroots projects through non-extractive financing in the form of 0% loans. The fund is governed by five movement partners representing democratically controlled loan and investment funds spread around the country. So at the table are Climate Justice Alliance, East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, EB Perk, Equitable Food Oriented Development Fund, the Matriarch, Matriarch Revolutionary, Revolutionary Fund, Fund, and Right to the City Alliance that also works nationally and have folks around here too. So they're, so they're just, just working, working at the, looking, looking at changing the investment, investment policies and strategies and actually, and actually approaching foundations to say, it's not, it's not just about, about grant making your portfolio, your portfolio. How, how do we, we actually, actually operationalize social justice in the way that you do your work? work. Maybe, Maybe that is in a land tax. tax. Maybe this is actually investments and, and moving dollars out of the extractive market into community-led hands and funds. So we want to proliferate that opportunity by just even experimenting as, a per, as folks that aren't foundation, um, or we're not a foundation, but a political home for folks. But our hope is to lift this um, kind of experiment up so that other foundations will do the same.
Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you all. You all. Um, so, so at the Alliance, Alliance um, in addition to community and coalition building and storytelling, another key area of work for us is community wealth building. And so in this space of community wealth building, the area that we have been spending a lot of energy and the project I want to highlight is our new local food economy lab. It's a new initiative that centers racial equity and community ownership. And in particular, it really works to support the viability and success of small scale black and brown farmers, fishermen, and food business owners within the region. And when we say that it's um, rooted in racial equity and community ownership, what we mean by community ownership is exactly what you're describing. Um, Kimmy, it's models like cooperatives, which many of us are familiar, are probably most familiar with. Um, also land trusts, um, which we do not have many of in San Diego County. Um, also, also equitable, equitable food-oriented food developments, developments, which some, some of you in the, in the area might, might be aware of, of um, Project New Village, a lot of the um, projects also that are being seeded in the transformative climate communities. Grant that Dominique shared are also equitable food-oriented developments. What these um, community ownership models have in common is that they are built by and for the communities that they're intended for. And, and so, so with, with the, the local food economy lab, lab, we are trying to support more of that. And, and one, one of the, the through, 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 through sort of a holistic, holistic approach that includes, includes you know, know, providing, providing um, and or connecting, connecting um, opportunities, opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer -peer learning, 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 for accessing essential resources, resources for policy advocacy, advocacy and, and capital. capital. So within the capital space in particular, we recently have been, um, we have an advisory group that is comprised of black and brown food business owners, farmers, fishermen, and food business owners. So as um, you all mentioned, the root of this is that we're not the ones making the decisions and we're not the ones deciding um, what is needed. We're ac it's actually the community that, is, that we're serving and or we are all collectively supporting that is making those decisions and driving where we go and the pace that we go. So the advisors of the Local Food Economy Lab um, and others um, have really identified essential needs around accessing capital and the types of capital that they need in order for them to be able to um, build out their vision for their community or for their enterprise. And, and so, so capital, capital is, is obviously, um, uh, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of different forms of capital. capital. So there's, um, there's, there's debt capital, capital and, and there's grant capital, capital, capital and there's equity. equity. And, and what, what we've heard primarily is that what is needed is grant capital and very zero or very low um, percent interest um, loans. And, and these, these are, are the exact forms, forms of capital, capital that are historically not available for the group of people that were support. So, so the alliance is now recognizing um, that, that there is a gap. And if we really do want to support community ownership in the region, we need to find, create, extract the right types of capital to align that with the values and the needs on the ground. So, so we, we are um, starting, starting to um, do uh, leverage, leverage public, leverage, leverage our position, like I think all of us are saying, saying that, that, you know, you know first naming and acknowledging the position of privilege that we are in, in um, and, and recognizing, recognizing the role that, that we can play, and that is to leverage public and private dollars and, and to try to get, get that out into the community in the form that they need it. And not, and not just, just get, get the money, money out, but also have, have the community be the ones that are deciding how the money gets out and who gets the money. So, so we did apply for a USDA grant um, last year. It's a two and a half million dollar grant um, that we were able to get that's called Land Capital Markets. And it's specifically to support um, black and brown farmers um, in San Diego County with um, accessing land capital land and capital prim primarily. And, and so, so um, a, a more, more than, than a third, third of that, that is 
funding that is specifically going to be for a fund, a grant fund that is co-designed by farmers in order for them to decide how that money gets distributed. And so it's models like that that we are trying to um, experiment more with. So leverage more public dollars. And there's challenges with that. You know, there's one out right now that we have been, you know, debating whether we go after. And a lot of these public dollars come with a lot of strings. So part of our um, role also is to understand those, not accept those strings, understand those strings and figure out how we can change that, change those. And so there's a component of resource organizing that also accompanies the resource mobile work that, that we're doing. And this holds true for public and private capital. There's a lot of work that needs to happen to, to really be able to shift that capital in a way so that it can be, um, so it can really meet the needs. And I think a lot of funders, actually public and private, the result, they want that. It's just there's a lot that needs to happen in between it, it, it to actually make that happen. And, and so, so that's, that's another area where we see um, our role in helping to, um, to bridge that. Thank you. So I hope you're hearing that there's a lot of shifting of power, shifting of money, how we move money, um, a lot of questions being asked, a lot of bold action, collective action. Um, and so we also want to say, though, right, we all here represent organizations, right? <laughs> and we want to make sure that we uplift all members of the alliance. And so we know that mobilizing resources for community ownership is beyond even organizations and institutions and foundations. And we want to lift up the people that are doing that at the individual level with no sort of formal organization. So we just want to say we, we acknowledge that that's happening. Today, we're here representing organizations, working in partnership with individuals and institutions in our nonprofit industrial complex. <laughs> Um, so I want to open it up uh, for Q&A. Maybe we have uh, some time for one or two questions before we go into roundtable discussions. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Do you want? Sure. I was asking Dominique how they went about creating some of the resident advisory boards. Uh, in Barrio Logan. Sure. Uh, so a, a lot of it was based on our already existing organizing model. So Environmental Health Coalition organizes in the communities that rank at the highest of the Calenviro screen tool. So if you haven't heard of it, please look up the Calenviro screen tool, type in your address. It'll tell you the pollution impact in your neighborhood and also your vulnerability to it, and then do some comparisons with other communities. So we work in those that are ranked the highest in the county, and so we already had existing community organizers in each of those neighborhoods, and we organize residents through what we call a community action team. So they come together, they meet monthly, and they're the ones that tell us what the issues are. So if you ever go to our webpage, our social media, we go work on so many issues that because it's all different, each community has different needs. So National City is very focused on food, very focused on green space, as compared to Logan, that's, compar that's really focused on air quality, on the trucks that are on the street. And so we already had a lot of existing networks, but for this particular project, what we did is our community organizers helped us to do community forums. So we hosted three workshops for this specific application to get people's input. And at the workshop, we asked, would you be interested in helping to be the governance for this application? And so we got interest from there. And then we also did a survey. So we tabled and we door knocked and we shared the survey with people asking, what are your priorities for this application? And on that um, survey, we also had the opportunity for people to indicate if they were interested. Um, and it's been difficult to have a community advisor where there have been very challenging conversations, like I mentioned about the partner that stepped away from the application. And like, what does that do to your application? That partner was bringing in like, you know, $3 million in leverage. And so, and so like, how does that, that it's a, it, it, was, it was a difficult, difficult conversation to have of like balancing your competitiveness as an application and your, and your responsiveness as like a community stakeholder. stakeholder. Um, and so, yes, it, that's kind of how we brought it together and uh, we do have a dedicated community organizer who's keeping it going. And really quickly, how big is that advisory board 
and have you had some challenges in terms of turnover or people staying on board? Yeah, yeah the, the goal, goal is the advisory, advisory board, board our, our, our goal, goal is to stay around 16, around 16. And, and I, I, I definitely, definitely say it's say been it's challenging to keep people engaged, engaged especially because the application was so rigorous. We constantly needed their feedback, feedback so they were meeting every week. Of course, of course we, were we were stipending them, we were offering, offering food, food for them to come, come but, but it, it was, was difficult to maintain constant you know, engagement, engagement because people have other needs and they have other things that they're doing. Um, but um, we're, we're, we're taking, taking a little, little break, break right now while the state considers our application. We'll find out in December if we get it or not. And then we'll re-engage the advisory board and grow the advisory board, board once, once we actually, actually get, get the funds. funds. Hello, I was just wondering if they took accountability for that, you know, the people that were going to contribute the three million, did they step up, did that enact change, did they take accountability for that, or are they still separate from that funding? Uh, uh, so so the, they, they were bringing, bringing the funding, funding with them, them. So, so when, when they, they left the application, the application they, they took the funding, funding with, them. with them. Right, but are they different now, or have they changed, or are they still standing on that? I, I don't, don't think, think so. <laughs> Thank you for this. I really appreciate learning and listening from you all. My name is Suparna. I work with an organization called COFED. And I'm curious in this, you named the nonprofit industrial complex. You've talked about seeding the way for community organizations, for folks on the ground doing the work. I'm curious to hear from you at a more um, personal human level, while you wear these hats in the nonprofit industrial complex, so what abundance could feel like for our communities, moving from wage to wealth to actually feeling that abundance, um, because the revolution will not be funded. So how do we embody that abundance? Um, the morning session that I came from was with young folks doing this work. And I'm so inspired by it, that's my job. But then I'm also wondering, how do we leave a legacy of hope behind for people? So in your bodies and your spirits, what does abundance feel like for folks who are doing philanthropic work? Thank you. Ooh. Uh, that was a that was a really great question. Um, I, I I appreciate the nonprofit industrial complex. That's a whole different conversation. But I think that. But I think I'll just kind of start with that a little bit. I I think it does take bravery for leaders to step back and say that you do have to push systems and you do have to push electeds and you do have to be rather direct in that way. And and you know the fear of losing funding or the fear of being less competitive. That's, that's always, always gonna, gonna gonna creep up, up to be honest. honest. Um, um, my my team is here, and they know that I'm kind of known as that big mouth, mouth but I'm known as the big mouth because I also respect, respect the work that we do, and I truly, truly, truly do believe in community power. And, and so, so the impact, impact of the work that we're having, no matter what funders or government or electeds want to say about me, or about what I'm saying, they can't overlook the impact, right? Because there is problem solving and solutions happening through our community at the community level. Um, and I think they figured that out, that, well, you know, we can we can not have her at a meeting, but then she's over here or her team's over here talking about impact and people are getting fed and houses are getting built and entrepreneurs are coming, becoming their own uh, wealth, you know, wealth builders. Um, so, so I think, I think that's, that's one part of it, and I, I, I hope, hope that, that more nonprofit leaders look at that, that um, because, because we are somewhat stuck in that circle sometimes of, of you know, what's going to happen. happen. I say this often of, like, what could they do, fire me? Then I'll go find another job. I'm great at what I do. So I'll go find another job, but we got to continue to use this platform to push. The other thing in terms of wealth building for our community, one thing as an organization that we're committed to is, um, and, and this is just in terms of leadership and how we are trying to be part of the solution around building wealth is we employ 70% of our community. Um, and as of two years ago, we decided that we needed to look at a equitable salary compensation analysis. 
Um, I know all of you have heard this, right? If you work in nonprofit, you're not going to make a lot of money. If you, we just don't have enough to pay you. And that's a, that's a bunch of BS. Like I'm sitting here as an executive director and I'm telling you, my job is hard. My job is hard to, to look at that salary line item, but that's my job. That's, that's my job to make sure that my community, if we're employing 70% of them, that they should be able to live and work in their community and feed their families and have a home. That's, that's, that's my, my job. job. That's, that's our job as an organization. So, so I think, think that's, that's where we start, right? right? Like, like how, how can we use our platform, our position, to inject some of those wealth building practices into place? Um, and the other thing I will say, as an organization, we're also committed to growing leadership. And so every one of our employees gets $1,000 to explore leadership. Um, we've employed really young leaders because I truly believe I'm not going to be innovative in five years. So I need to move out of the way, and I need to make room for young leaders to come in, be that voice of the community, move things along. That's just the way this works. And I, again, I will say that's a principle that I don't hear a lot in nonprofit. We, a lot of our leaders love to stay in, in these seats for a really long time. And that's not innovative. That's not challenging. You're not doing it. Again, I'm just calling it out. You're just not. After a couple of years, this is really hard work. So we're putting our money where our mouth is. We have to. That's our job, where it starts. That's part of our value system. Um, I don't do this alone, though. I have a great leadership team, a great board, and every single one of them, we've done a value check. Is this where you want, like, is this where we're going? Because if this is not where you're going, then you probably shouldn't be here. And that's the reality of it. So I think it starts there of our own value systems, how we can inject that. Um, looking, looking at that, that privilege of power that you have individually, individually and making sure you can continue to do that. And, and for me, I'm speaking up on that. I'm going to other leaders and saying, look at what we're doing, hoping that other leaders also stand up and do it. Because if we can at least start with one place, it can continue to grow. And we do want to make sure that, that our families, we can at least start there with, with our privilege of power that we have. Mm-hmm, uh-huh, mm-hmm. Well, actually, um, you know, Justice Wonders, we were a fiscally sponsored project for many, many years, and just recently, you're, you're talking about worker compensation, but we recently um, became, maybe two years ago, to um, we left our fiscal sponsor, become our own um, uh, uh, 501c3, but we voted as a team at that time to actually shift the structure into a worker self-directed nonprofit. I was, I was like, like, if we're, we're trying, trying to convince, convince foundations, foundations to, to fund these, these what, what, what what would be we, we what, what can we do, do just as a philanthropic, philanthropic serving organization, organization to show the power and function of doing so? And, and so, so it has been an experiment. experiment. We have we shifted, shifted co-directorship. Co I'm just and naming the, the abundance, abundance mindset, mindset, even in imagining powerful organizations, organizations and that trusting ourselves to self-govern. It's a it's it sounds amazing and yes we we but I think I just I want to be real. I was like. We, we were, were defining, defining it for about two years, years about what we don't, don't want to be. But it was it's much harder and it takes much more heart and love for yourself and one another to actually embody what it is we want versus saying we don't want that. So what is it? And so one of those things was actually doing a worker. Um, we, we hadn't been able to look at that for four years. And we took a look at that and we're like, oh. And we, we decided to still keep developmental hierarchy, but we've split up co-director positions to five circles. So governance, um, people-centered systems, regenerative finance, um, program strategy cohesion, and learning and engagement and culture. So a lot of those things that are usually held by an ED, we're trying to share that, and everyone on staff serves on two circles. We, we, we all have, all have voting, voting power. power. We, we wrote, wrote our, our own handbook. handbook. We put we policies in there. We gave we ourselves $17,000 raises. I've, I've never been, been in, 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 in just, just a vote, vote but, but we were like, like oh, the, the board. And, and it, it just, just leveled, leveled up. up. It gave all of us, we're like, we're doing this in committing to get and resourcing ourselves so that we can also resource this work. And it was a, it's been a courageous act, but also one that has just like inspired me and really believed in our ability to govern ourselves and work through conflict and challenges without also just turning on the same tools of those systems. It's like, how can we have principled struggle and find beauty in the struggle together? Because um, we can't just run to HR. That's us. Like, we, you know, it's like, you know what I'm saying? So that, I mean, I just want to say that on an organizational level. 
And a part of I just really appreciate, I, I took that question to heart. You heard me just say that, but I think that abundance piece, if I think about it really personally as someone um, that has always been deeply rooted in community building and uh, hold social justice and community change, not just as a value of what I'm fighting for, but that vision of what is possible. I want to keep that spirit up this like portal of a time as the pandemic has flowed, I'd really have to, ex I really had to interrogate what, it, what relationship to myself as a change agent do I have to receiving sacred reciprocity? Am I gonna allow myself to be cared for by others? Will I be, will I trust others to meet my needs? Um, and I'm an older daughter, immigrant, all these things, I've been socialized to take care of everybody else. I will get in front of anything like I, you know? And, and I, will I will always do it on behalf of someone. Of someone. But, but it was a really, really I think, deep, 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 deep question for me to say, say where am I being fed? fed? Where is where sacred reciprocity there with me? me? And, and I, I mentioned plant, plant medicine earlier, but, but I think also the deep work of just being in relationship to nature. I've been on like a plant medicine apprenticeship and my most recent teacher was Sambagita. It's the flower of the Philippines. And I was growing it and eating four weeks, um, um, and, and you know, I, I, I bought a plant on Etsy, Etsy. I was I smelling it every, every day, it just smelled like my Lola, Lola at night, and it just, you know, comforted me. I do meditation and somatic practices. I bought the Sambagita plant for this day long for Philippinex Buddhists in a space, um, and just saw its beauty, right? And like, one thing I would say, it taught me, I was like, oh, these flowers, I just thought they were like roses, that those flowers just stay, and they only pop out at night, and then they, they die, die the next, next morning. morning. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, jasmine flowers, they're so, and I would get so sad. And then two days later, there is another blossom right there. And I was like, oh, all those blossoms, those jasmine flowers I see in Oakland, the Sambagita plant from the Philippines, it's just like, it regenerates, it regenerates. And one day it would all happen, it all, all the flowers fell and I got hella sad. And my plant teacher was like, you, have you pruned it yet? And I was like, oh, we supposed to prune it? You know, so I, I'm learning, I'm learning my Oakland, Oakland garden, my kitchen garden, y'all, you know, I'm a renter. But I was like, so I started cutting it and I was like, it's not, do, did I kill it, you know? And I was just like watering it, putting in the sunshine, praying over it. I was like, I don't want to kill this Sambagita plant. And then like, you know, a week or two later, Boom, there's, there's the like, like leaves, leaves again. again. It's, it's like, like I, I needed, needed to, to actually prune it back and, and let, let all that, that growth that was there this summer. summer. I, needed I needed to let let it go, go so that, that there would be room for new roots, roots you know, new new, new leaves. leaves. So there, so there is, is something about, about that, like, like where, where does sacred reciprocity show up in the relationships? How do I let trust the world to hold me and care for my grief, care for my anger? And then how do I look to nature and its cycles? To be, be like, like, oh, let, let me live, live within, within sacred reciprocity of the seasons and the cycles of the way things grow and die and, die and live on. Thank you. <laughs> and I also welcome you to check out these posters that we have here on the wall, the San Diego Food System Alliance, myself and team members, along with members of the Alliance, sort of had discussions around naming the harm, reclaiming our values, and then um, talking about when we center community, love and healing, what would this feel like? And so I just wanna also honor sort of the voices of folks that are also not in this room where we've had these discussions. And so um, if you wanna t take a look at those posters at the end of this session, please. Um, I wanna make sure we have enough time for some connection among all of us. So thank you, thank you, thank you to our wonderful panelists here. Thank you for sharing your heart. Thank you for doing the work that you're doing. Thank, thank you, you for being brave and courageous. So I'm gonna just have y'all join some, uh, some tables here um, and I have some instructions for you all. So you're gonna, do some introductions, right? Do some, some quick introductions, name, pronouns, organization, and then maybe select a note taker and a reporter for each group. At the end of this, we'll be doing some quick share out so that we kind of hear what's going on sort of um, in the room. And so going back to our question related to power, I, I really do think that in this work, um, when we talk about community o ownership, when we talk about money, it's always a 
conversation about power, but I also think it's about healing, right? We know that there's internal healing that we need to do and that there's healing th among our communities that we also have to do. And so here's just two prompts for you. What feels powerful about the work to mobilize resources for community ownership? Um, and then what sort of allies resources do you need to continue uh, to shifting ownership? If something else resonates with you in your table, go for it. Um, so we'll have about 10 minutes and then we'll come back and then do some quick um, uh, share outs and then we'll do some networking at the end. Thanks. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'll start over. I'm Stephanie, I use she, her pronouns. Um, at my table we talked about recognizing the power that we have within ourselves, um, not the need to like get any more power in order to have it or use it, um, but recognizing what we have and then recognizing the power um, in others and the power in our community um, and lifting up the power that they already have, um, bringing them into spaces where their power can be recognized um, and distributing the power dynamics. Anybody here? Hi everyone, my name is Johnny. I use she, they pronouns. Um, we talked about, uh, we talked about a lot of things, but we first started talking about how complex and multifaceted power is and also how power is catalytic. And we reflected on the conversation today about how um, it was noted when someone said, you know, we're actually doing something and we don't need someone to validate ourselves and about how, um, how much power there can be in the collective and then um, about how all power when it is, um, how the um, how intentional we have to be to untangle um, power and privilege, and how those two things kind of, you know, work together. And someone mentioned how it's kind of like a dance, um, maybe like a puzzle piece. But um, that was so. We talked a lot about the power from within, and then shared some personal stories about how um, people at our table notice power within community. Um, and the communities that they've, and organizations they've worked in. Good afternoon, everybody. I, I don't feel like we had enough time. We were just going back around the table and it was like, oh, we're done? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I think two of the main things that came from what we talked about was um, spirit versus will and being able to have service and to prioritize service to the unseen stakeholders who might not be at the table or who might not have the voice to get across what they need and the problems and the solutions that are critical to those problems that other people may not even consider or may not be something from the outside looking in that you would immediately think that would be a solution. Um, the second thing that we came up with were how important community-led initiatives are, as we've heard a lot on the panel and how that really gives empowerment for the community to identify their own solutions to the problems. Hello everyone, my name is Jessica and I'm from Terra Madre Gardens. I've been farming for 20 years and um, one of the things that we spoke about here is um, in my personal, uh, one of our, of our um, participants here mentioned how Sometimes when we look outside, especially with what's going on right now in the world, we can feel so disempowered, right? That sense of, of power um, just kind of escapes us. And seeing that we're incapable of changing things on that great scale brings that sense of powerlessness. Um, for me, it, it, it brings me back to my center, knowing that as, as, as a farmer, I have been doing my part and I can only do my part and that it, it will not happen in my lifetime probably, but if we all keep doing our, our part and centering ourselves, then change will happen. Um, another thing that we have here on our notes is how taking back our power, our community power in these ways of owning, owning our land, owning our time, owning our art, owning ourselves, um, brings power back to us. And um, one last thing that came about is being able to 
uh, somehow protect this work that we've been doing for the next seven generations? How can we get to that point in which we are working with for what we can right now, but that we somehow ensure that the work that we're doing now can last at least seven generations, and then those generations can pick up on it, and like my ancestors did, build pyramids that last forever, right? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I hope that you left with more stories from San Diego about how we're doing that. I hope you're leaving feeling inspired by folks that you heard today. I hope that you're feeling inspired by the people at your table. This work is necessary, it's possible, it's happening now, and it will continue to happen, right? Um, I love what Jessica said about just, you know, keep doing what, we're, you're, what you're doing, right? And it's working. We're obviously here. And folks are paving the way for us as well. So thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to close out the session, but please network with each other. Feel free to share kind of what, you, what came alive for you today. We're going to be playing some music. So really, honestly, get to know each other, right? This is why we're here. Thank you.